I'm Nicole Burley. It is Wednesday, August 25th. This is Rush Hour. Those top stories in just a moment. This is our News Nation network of stations. Hundreds of reporters spread all across the country. And tonight, we are also following the ongoing efforts in D.C. to evacuate Americans out of Afghanistan. More than 80,000 airlifted out. Right now, it's unclear how many remain with less than a week until that August 31st deadline. And nearly a year after the FBI uncovered a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, the first person sentenced to prison in that scheme that was handed down today how long he will be behind bars. And body cam footage out of Louisiana showing a state trooper repeatedly repeatedly beating a black man with a flashlight as that man is screaming, I'm not resisting. Why it took more than two years for the footage to come to light. But let's start with the latest on the pandemic. Moderna has completed its request for full FDA approval of its COVID vaccine. Now, Pfizer earned that distinction earlier this week. Meanwhile, both Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson report new trial data showing a third booster shot leads to a significant increase in COVID antibodies. And that comes as cases are spiking all across America, specifically among young people. Hospitals in Texas and Virginia, among those experiencing a critical shortage in those pediatric ICU beds. And country music legend Garth Brooks planning a tour of dive bars after he canceled the remainder of his stadium tour because of the pandemic, but fans must be vaccinated in order to attend. No other details about that tour have been released. And now to a COVID bombshell out of New York, but only about 48 hours into her tenure as governor, Kathy Hochul acknowledging a significant COVID death discrepancy, confirming thousands of additional deaths not reported by her predecessor, Andrew Cuomo. News Nation correspondent Tom Negevin live for us tonight in New York. Tom, the new governor says this is all in the interest of transparency. That's exactly right, Nicole, and a very important distinction that by design immediately sets Governor Kathy Hochul well apart from her predecessor, revealing about 12,000 as of right now unreported COVID deaths in the state of New York, unreported by Governor Cuomo. Uh, the, the state of New York now reporting about 55,000 COVID deaths as opposed to the 43,400 that Governor Cuomo had been reporting uh, by the end of day Monday, his last day in the state's highest office. In revealing those numbers, Kathy Hochul reiterating that transparency will be the hallmark of her administration. Until now, there's been a big discrepancy noted between the fatality numbers re re released by uh, New York State and reported by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The count used by Cuomo in his regular and you'll recall uh, very popular COVID media briefings included only lab confirmed COVID-19 deaths reported through a state system that collects data from hospitals, nursing homes, adult care facilities. That meant that those who passed away as a result of COVID-19 outside of those settings at home, for example, or without a COVID test confirming a COVID-19 death went unreported. Cuomo's critics had long charged he was tacitly manipulating the numbers to burnish his leadership, if you will on the fight against the uh, coronavirus pandemic in the United States. His camp actually responding to this just a short time ago, saying that while presumed COVID deaths may not have been included in the state's total over the last few months, the information has been made publicly available. The governor, of course, resigning in the midst of a sexual harassment scandal. Governor Kathy Hochul says she is also right now in the midst of purging from state government anyone associated with that scandal and mentioned in the state attorney general's report on it. Nicole? Yeah, I'm sure we will hear much more on this. All right, Tom, thank you. We are monitoring the ongoing evacuation efforts in Afghanistan. Plus, amid a shortage of ICU beds, doctors facing the unthinkable decision of prioritizing which patients get treatment and which don't. But first, let's turn to Florida, where Governor Ron DeSantis is fighting some new COVID restrictions on multiple fronts. News Nation correspondent Brian Enton live for us tonight at Port Miami. So, Brian, some new setbacks today for the governor. 
Yeah, Nicole, another record broken when it comes to COVID cases here in Florida. 26,000 new cases just yesterday uh, in the sun, in Sunshine State. And we're seeing more companies going against the governor now and requiring the vaccine, in cru including uh, new cruise lines. Disney Cruise Lines, the latest now to say you have to have a vaccine if you're over 12 years of age to get on one of their ships that goes through the Bahamas. Norwegian, Carnival, and Royal Caribbean already require the vaccine, defying the governor. This as the school mask debate in Florida also heating up. Governor DeSantis, of course, has said that uh, mask mandates are not allowed in districts. But take a look at this. Now, 10 different school districts, among the biggest in the entire state, have mask mandates going against the governor. Today, uh, it's become very volatile in Fort Lauderdale. At Fort Lauderdale High School, there was actually a fight. One of the parents showed up, did not want his daughter wearing a mask, and actually went after another student. No, 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 no. So it did get uh, violent there. That father was arrested back here at the port. These cruise lines put in sort of an interesting position because right now the Bahamas is requiring the vaccine for passengers. So they feel like at this point they have to go against the governor uh, and start requiring the vaccine. Nicole. Yeah, Brian, we never want to see those like parents going after it, especially somebody else's kids. My goodness. Yeah. All right. Brian, thank you. Well, climbing COVID cases are leading to jam-packed emergency rooms, and now some health workers say they're once again becoming overwhelmed, their resources strained to the limits. News Nation correspondent Marky Martin is live for us tonight in Dallas. So, Marky, this new surge is forcing some very, very tough conversations. Yeah, Nicole, you know, in many parts of the country, hospital staff has never been in shorter supply, which only, you know, exacerbates the pressure, uh, the strain, the pain on care as well as capacity. And now you have certain hospital systems that are debating whether or not to start prioritizing vaccinated patients. I've zipped up too many body bags. We've seen way too many people die over the last year and a half. An Oklahoma nurse speaking for medical professionals everywhere. Right now our resources are stretched thin and you know we can't keep this up long term. The state now has 1,500 people hospitalized with COVID and simply no room for more patients. Because our beds are full all of the time, um, we have to decide when a bed opens up who gets that bed. We've also heard the same cry from Texas. Please don't get on a motorcycle, don't have a trauma, don't have a heart attack because we're going to be at a point where we can't manage you. In Dallas last week, a task force charged with setting critical care guidelines was called together. A question raised when it comes to getting an ICU bed, should hospitals begin prioritizing vaccinated patients? This was a discussion item that unfortunately got leaked to the local newspaper as though we had modified the guidelines. We had not. Stephen Love is the CEO of the DFW Hospital Council. He said he wants to clear the air after conflicting reports surfaced. We're absolutely not going to in any way have anyone excluded. But could it happen later on? Has that been ruled out? Well, we certainly hope not. And, you know, another group considering vaccination status, insurance companies. Just today, Delta Airlines announcing that they would be adding a $200 monthly surcharge to insurance premiums for its employees who decide not to get vaccinated. Also coming forward and saying they will also be limiting uh, sick time for their employees who don't roll up their sleeves. Nicole. Wow, yeah, and Delta probably will not be the last company to do that. All right. Thank you, Marky. Let's shift now to the latest developments out of Afghanistan. The round-the-clock evacuation efforts have seen thousands of Americans and U.S. allies airlifted out of Kabul, but hundreds more are still waiting. News Nation White House correspondent Allison Harris live for us tonight in D.C. So, Alice, Allison, what did we learn today? Much more, Nicole, just like we're learning every day as this keeps continuing. We're now getting told how many Americans are thought to remain in Afghanistan. The Secretary of State saying the U.S. believes a thousand Americans are still there with 4,500 Americans already evacuated. The U.S. has been in contact with 500 Americans hoping to be evacuated. They've been talking to them within the past 24 hours. The Pentagon saying today that 10,000 people are at the airport in Kabul. They are waiting to be taken 
taken out of the country as well. The Pentagon saying that troops are going to continue to evacuate people up to that August 31st deadline that's set by the president. But in the next few days, in the last few days of this mission, equipment and troops also have to be prioritized to be moved out of the country. We also learned that today that the State Department has put out 19 messages since March urging Americans to leave. That message becoming more dire as the U.S. is drawing nearer to that deadline. For the remaining roughly 1,000 contacts that we had who may be Americans seeking to leave Afghanistan, we're aggressively reaching out to them multiple times a day. Let me be crystal clear about this. There is no deadline on our work to help any remaining American citizens who decide they want to leave to do so, along with the many the Secretary of State saying today that the U.S. is working relentlessly to help Americans and help Afghan allies, people who helped the U.S. The Pentagon detailing three missions, at least three emergency missions that have happened so far in which helicopters have traveled beyond the security perimeter at the airport to evacuate Americans. President Biden did not answer any questions personally today about what will happen if Americans and some of those Afghan interpreters are still stuck in Afghanistan beyond August 31st. Nicole? Yeah, because that deadline very quickly approaching. All right, Allison, thank you. The Supreme Court today dealing a big blow to the Biden administration, denying its attempts to end his predecessor's so-called Remain in Mexico program. So what remains unclear is how quickly people will be affected by this decision. News Nation correspondent Evan Lambert live for us tonight in Washington. Evan, what is the administration's next move? Nicole, tonight the Biden administration is weighing its legal options after the Supreme Court rejected its attempt to undo this controversial Trump era policy on migrants at the southern border. Remain in Mexico is the policy that we're talking about. It means that migrants seeking asylum in the U.S. have to wait in Mexico while their cases are processed. That is back. The Supreme Court refusing to halt an order from a lower court in Texas that reinstated that program, which means remain in Mexico again the law of the land. The order from the nation's high court cited a previous ruling which said then President Trump could not end his predecessor Barack Obama's DACA policy in a similar way. President Biden ended the Trump administration's policy known officially as the Migrant Protection Protocols right after his inauguration, calling it inconsistent with the administration's values. But Texas sued and a federal judge there ordered the program reinstated. Tonight, Republicans in Congress are applauding that decision while immigrants' rights advocates here calling it an outrage. I think they get easy entry through our southern border because of the policies of the Biden administration and this reverses, uh, puts back the remain in Mexico asylum um, policy uh, of the Trump administration. It was largely only removed because it was from the Trump administration uh, and it makes sense. Ciudad Juarez, Tijuana, uh, Matamoros, they are cities that are violent. I mean, there's a uh, criminal violence happening. So again, these families will be sent to that violence and to those conditions. It's a failed program that actually that violates the rights of, uh, of, of, of refugees and asylum seekers. This legal battle is not over. The administration saying it will comply with the Supreme Court's order. They say, though, that this setback is not the final word and vow to continue to find ways to end this policy. Nicole. All right. Not the final word. Evan, thank you. Well, the first prison sentence handed down late this afternoon in the alleged plot to kidnap Michigan's governor. Ty Garbett, one of six defendants, now sentenced to six years in prison. News Nation's Kyle Mitchell from our Grand Rapids station WOOD is at the courthouse tonight. So, Kyle, what happened at that hearing? Nicole, prosecutors are happy with the outcome at this hearing. Now, in addition to spending just under six years in prison, Garvin will have three years of probation and pay a $2,500 fine. Prosecutors say they expect Garvin to testify against the other men charged in this case, saying he will be their, quote, star witness. Now, helping to show this was a plot the men intended to carry out and was not a case of entrapment by investigators, which some other defendants have claimed. Cameras are not allowed in the courtroom, but we heard Garvin apologize to Governor Whitmer and her family. Garvin also said he will work to help others from becoming radicalized. Garvin's attorney says his client accepts responsibility and has cooperated with investigators. I think Ty was, was both relieved, 
appreciative, but most of all, I think Ty, I think Ty, this is what we hoped for. I wouldn't go so far as to say we expected, but what we hoped for it. In her victim impact statement, the governor says the threats have taken a toll. She also thanks law enforcement officers for the work that they've done on this case. It reads in part, quote, but even now we not, have not reached the far shore. Threats continue. I've looked out my window and seen large groups of heavily armed people within 30 yards of my home. I've seen myself hung in effigy. Days ago at a demonstration, there was a sign that called for burning the witch. For me, things will never be the same. Now, the judge reiterated a part of that victim impact statement that said that violence and threats have no place in our democracy. Nicole? Yeah, they certainly don't. All right. Kyle, thank you. On new tonight, body camera footage kept from the public for more than two years was now finally released, showing a Louisiana police officer beating a man after a traffic stop in 2019. A state police investigation shows Aaron Larry Bowman hit 18 times with a flashlight, leaving him with a broken jaw, six staples in his head, and other injuries. That incident, one of 23 use of force incidents by the same officer. News Nation's LeBron Joseph from our New Orleans station WGNO joining us now. So, LeBron, 19 of those use of force incidents involve black people. Yes, uh, trouble for sure from the Louisiana State Police. The state trooper described that as pain compliance, that arrest with that motorist. It's drawn fire from a whole lot of critics here in Louisiana, and the ACLU has questions. This video was not released uh, for two years, more than two years. This is exactly the same situation that happened in the Ronald Green case. And we are all familiar with that because we just finished having that conversation. That's Alana Odoms of the ACLU of Louisiana pointing out the similarities of yet another black motorist beaten in 2019 at the hands of the Louisiana State Police. This incident occurred just three weeks after the Ronald Green murder. And there are other similarities. In this case, Trooper Brown was involved in both incidents. Brown was arrested and charged with second degree battery and malfeasance in office after it was determined that he misled the agency by mislabeling the footage as a citizen encounter. He resigned from the department. As a result of the beating, the motorist Aaron Bowman suffered three broken ribs, a broken jaw, broken wrist, and serious cuts to the head. Here's what Bowman told the Associated Press. I kept thinking I was going to die that night because all I can do was breathe, you know, and try to keep myself from just going out because he got my face mashed down in my puddle of water. So Bowman has filed a civil lawsuit. And as for the Louisiana State Police, they sent us this statement. Detectives concluded that Brown engaged in excessive, unjustifiable actions and failed to report use of force to his supervisors. They've also implemented critical changes throughout the department and continue to process the building trust within the communities they serve. Uh, another note, the DOJ is investigating this case, but those three charges against Bowman, the motorist, continue to stand. Back to you. Wow. All right. Yeah, that video is very hard to watch. LeBron, thank you. Mm -hmm. Still ahead tonight on Rush Hour, 17 years after his murder conviction, Scott Peterson facing a judge again today. Will he succeed in his new push for a new trial? And the popular OnlyFans website now reversing course less than a week after banning sexual content from its platform. Why the company is walking back its original decision. An online subscription platform is reversing course on banning sexual content following fierce backlash from content creators. OnlyFans now says it stands for inclusion and will provide a home for all creators. News Nation correspondent Nancy Liu joining us live tonight from Los Angeles. So Nancy, what are the creators saying about this reversal? 
Well, Nicole, there is relief, but there's also still a lot of anger. It was less than a week ago that OnlyFans announced a porn ban starting on October 1st. But after days of backlash from content creators, the British-based website is backing off. I initially just started doing this um, as like a, a little way to make a little bit of side money. That side money has turned into big money for Ohio mom Tiffany Mack. With support from her husband, the 25-year-old is among the top creators on OnlyFans. She delivers risque and nude photos to fulfill the wishes of subscribers. So my fans can vote what they want to see next or for example, you know, I'll say, you know, do you want to see this, this, or this? Her subscribers each pay $15 a month, and one of her sessions brought in $600 in tips alone. Catch me outside. How about that? In the spring, a teenage rapper who became known as the Catch Me Outside Girl posted this screenshot from her OnlyFans account. She set a record by earning a million dollars in just six hours. Sexually explicit content is a key moneymaker for OnlyFans, which is more than 130 million users. So the ban on porn caught many off guard. OnlyFans cited banking issues, but now says assurances are in place for all to carry on. You can cater to someone's specific request. It's very, you know, it is very much that where you are fulfilling this person's fantasy of what they want to see or what they want to experience. Now, in announcing the reversal, only fans thank people for speaking out, but some are demanding compensation or reduced fees since quite a few lost many subscribers or they switched to other platforms altogether. Nicole? Yes, yeah, so much money involved there. All right, Nancy, thank you. A cell head tonight on a rush hour, only days away from the official kickoff of college football season. How universities across the country are preparing to welcome fans amid rising COVID cases. And listen to this, a DNA discrepancy leads to a couple's worst nightmare, learning their 10-year-old son did not biologically belong to both of them. What happens next for this family? Welcome back to Rush Hour. Here's what's happening in your nation right now. And breaking news out of California, evacuations in place as firefighters work to contain the South Fire, which has already grown to 100 acres, burned multiple structures. This is a live look. This is in the Fontana area. It's about 50 miles east of Los Angeles. We will stay on top of this breaking news. We'll bring you any new updates. New York's new governor, Kathy Hochul, delivering on a promise to be more transparent than the previous administration, acknowledging 12,000 more COVID deaths than revealed under former Governor Andrew Cuomo. Governor Hochul's office says the COVID death toll is New York now tops 55,000. As many as 1,500 Americans still waiting for their ticket out of Afghanistan. That's according to the U.S. Secretary of State. And that's with just six days to go before President Biden's deadline for completing evacuations out of Kabul. The Pentagon says military airlifts of Americans and others will continue until the final hours of August 31st. 82,000 people have been evacuated so far. A federal appeals court today upheld the conviction and death sentence for a white man who killed nine members of a black church in South Carolina. A three-judge panel told Dylan Roof that the legal record cannot capture the full horror of his crimes. Roof is the first person in the country ever sentenced to death for a federal hate crime. There is currently a moratorium on federal executions. And convicted murderer Scott Peterson back in front of a judge today, hoping for a new trial nearly 20 years after being convicted for killing his wife and unborn son. News Nation's Teresa Estacio from our San Francisco station KRON breaking down what happened in court today. It was a very eventful day here in San Mateo County at this hearing. Bottom line, we may see Scott Peterson for the first time out of his prison cell in a very long time. Guilty was the verdict that rang out following a months long trial for Scott Peterson. But his defense attorney argues certain facts clouded the case, pointing to a juror 
that they said had an axe to grind. The juror, Rochelle Neese, Peterson's defense team argues, lied to be on the jury, failing to admit that she had been a victim of crime. Legal experts have long argued if she had been truthful, she would not have been in the jury room and not have convicted Peterson to a death sentence. Peterson appeared via closed circuit from San Quentin for the hearing. The judge in the end set a September hearing. Peterson's attorney explains that if and when an evidentiary hearing does take place, then Peterson would be transferred from San Quentin and then brought here to sit and wait and find out his fate once again. Here in San Mateo County, Teresa Stasio, back to you, Nicole. All right, thank you. Well, a Florida woman thought she had survived the worst of her COVID journey. Eight days in the hospital fighting for her life, but she recovered. Then, as she left the hospital thinking the worst was over, until she came across a grisly discovery in her bedroom. News Nation's Stacey DeSilva joining us now live from Central Florida with these heartbreaking details. Yeah, Nicole, this is just a tragic story any way you look at it. Lisa Stedman battled COVID in the hospital for eight days when she got home to finish that recovery. That's when she found her husband had died there from the virus. Lisa told me her husband, Ron, had tested positive for COVID first, but had just cold-like symptoms initially. When Lisa first went to the hospital for her COVID, her husband told her his phone had stopped charging. So after he was up and well during a wellness check, the first time he didn't answer his phone, Lisa figured his battery had died when he didn't answer again the next day. She realized that wasn't true when she entered their bedroom upon returning home. I called him. He didn't answer. I heard our little doggies barking in there with him. I opened the door. He was laying on the bed, already gone, had started decomposing. So the Stedmans were not vaccinated. Lisa said they believed the shot had not been tested enough, but after talking to her doctor, she will get her shot as soon as possible. On top of all that loss and trauma, she was required to pay $800 to clean out her bedroom after her husband's death. She also had to pay hundreds more to replace all that furniture. Back to you, Nicole. Oh, Stacy, that is absolutely heartbreaking. All right, thank you for that. Well, a Utah couple unable to have a second child thought they had finally found a way to have their perfect family thanks to in vitro fertilization. But more than a decade after the procedure gave them the healthy baby boy they had hoped and prayed for, they learned their son biologically only belongs to one of them. They had no idea who his father really was. News Nation's Jillian Smuckler sat down with that family for an exclusive interview. When I looked on that page and I saw um, mom for, for him, and then I saw father unknown. And, and I thought, what do you mean father unknown? I'm his father. Vanner and Donna Johnson started their IVF journey in 2007 after they were unable to have a second child on their own. But over a decade after they gave birth to a baby boy, their worst nightmare quickly became a reality. When my results showed up showing two sons immediately and seeing our oldest was a half sibling to his younger brother through me. We knew there must have been something wrong. A simple DNA test reveals Vanner Johnson is not his son's biological father and that Donna's egg was fertilized by someone else's sperm in the process. The Johnsons waited over a year to break the news to their son. Something happened and we're not sure what happened but I'm actually not your biological father. While Vanner doesn't remember much of that conversation. I remember the way that I felt and that he felt and uh, that he told me he loved me still. As the family grapples with the shocking news. I went through 18 months not knowing who the biological father of my son was, not having a clue, walking down the street and thinking, is it him? Could it be this person? They decided to take another DNA test, this time through Ancestry, to find out who his father really is. That's where Devin McNeil comes in. Obviously, we were very incredulous at first, but the more details that came out, the more evident it was that there was something that had happened that involved us. Eager to get some answers, the two families began piecing it all together until it added up. There was one date that we were in the clinic at the same time. I was doing transfer, so that's when they put the embryos back inside. 
and she was doing retrieval where they take her eggs and retrieve them. And it was that same day, we think around the same time, um, 14 years ago. Little did they know that that day would change their lives in more ways than one. They're supporting one another as they figure out what's next. And however comfortable they are, the McNeils are with what he would like and our son would like, that's what we'd like to do. Wow, well, that was Jillian Smuckler from our Salt Lake City station, KTVX. The University of Utah, where that procedure took place, released a statement saying they cannot comment on patient cases, but that safety is their main priority. So how rare is this? We dug into the topic, found a 2015 study that analyzed 12 years worth of IVF procedures, nearly 182,000 of them in total, and they found 99.97% of procedures saw no moderate nor significant issues. And in terms of IVF lab mismatches specifically, another study finds just over 50 instances of mismatches out of more than 17,000 cases. Now that's a rate under 0.3%. A third study found that mismatch rates caused by human error was between 0.11 and 0.12%. And by the way, both couples are set to join Marnie Hughes tonight on News Nation Prime. You can catch that at 9, 8, 7 Central. It just days away from the start of one of tennis's biggest tournaments, but breaking tonight, two of sports' biggest names now out of it. Why Venus and Serena Williams are pulling out of the U.S. Open. And it's one of the most iconic album covers in music history. You know this, Nirvana's Nevermind, featuring that naked baby in a swimming pool. Well, now that baby is all grown up and he is suing. Why he's taking legal action after all this time. All right, let's get you to breaking news tonight in sports. Some big names withdrawing from the U.S. Open, including both Williams sisters. News Nation's Andy Adler from our New York City station, WPIX, joining us. So Andy, Serena pulled out first, and then not that long ago, Venus did the same. What is going on? I mean, Nicole, all I can tell you is we hear the first we hear it from Serena and we think, oh, you know what? This is this is bad news. We want to see these stars at the U.S. Open. And then you mentioned it moments ago. We hear that her sister Venus also withdrawing from the U.S. Open. And again, same injury. They're talking about a leg injury. And it's it's crazy to think about it because the last time both sisters didn't participate at the U.S. Open, it was 2003. I mean, you're looking at this video right here and, and you can see, you know, she said that she had been trying to heal. She wanted to get back out there. And unfortunately, it was just too soon. The injuries just wouldn't heal. I have been in touch with Serena's coach. Uh, he'll be coming on Pix 11 Sports Nation soon to discuss this. But again, she's devastated. So is Venus. And you know what? I'll tell you, sports fans, tennis fans, very disappointing news between Nadal, Federer, and now the Williams sisters all out of the U.S. Open. What can I tell you? I wish I had better news. Don't don't shoot the messenger, okay, Nicole? All right, so Andy, you know, you mentioned, because of course we were talking about the women being out, big names on the men's side there. So how long has it been? I mean, all four of them aren't going to be in the U.S. Open. That's yeah. a big deal. It is a big deal. And, you know, especially because, think about it, last year the fans weren't able to attend the U.S. Open. So there's been a lot of hype leading into this U.S. Open. You know, we want to see the stars. And I say we because, look, I'm part of what I'm one of those tennis fans who wanted yeah. to see these stars play. So, so yes, it is, it is certainly disappointing. The star power won't be there at U.S. Open, but there are still many allures to watching this. And I know the fans are anxious to see the U.S. Open and in person this year. So, again, Nicole, wish I had better news for you. Well, yeah, at least it's in person and still lots of great players involved. Right. Andy, thank you so much. Thanks. Nicole. All right, let's shift from sports to entertainment and one of the most iconic album covers of all time. You've probably seen the naked baby on Nirvana's 1991 Nevermind album, but now that baby is all grown up suing the band for child pornography. News Nation's Sloan Glass joining us now. So Sloan, what is this lawsuit about? Yeah, Nicole, that baby is now 30 years old, and he says he is the victim of child exploitation. It's been nearly 30 years since Nevermind debuted in 1991. 
That album cover is famous all over the world. It shows a baby floating underwater, staring at a dollar bill dangling on a fishing hook. Now that baby is Spencer Eildon, who is now 30 years old, and Eildon claims the photo is child pornography, and he's suing the ban over alleged child sexual exploitation. He says the dollar bill in the picture makes the baby resemble a sex worker. And Eildon says he suffered lifelong damage from the picture. However, Eildon himself has sole poster copies of the album that he's autographed. He has also recreated the cover art himself, wearing shorts, thank goodness, on four separate occasions. And in 2015, he said the picture opened doors for him and was a positive experience. Eldon is suing for $150,000 from each of the 17 named defendants, including the surviving members of the band and the estate of late lead singer Kurt Cobain. The photographer and record executives are named in the suit as well. Eldon's family did get money for the picture and his parents were paid 200 bucks on the day of the shoot, but the album has sold more than 30 million copies. And get this. Floating Baby wasn't even the band's first choice for an album cover. Kurt Cobain wanted to show a mother giving birth underwater, but compromised on that photo. A decision I'm sure he would have regretted now. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, Sloan, I know you'll keep us updated on what happens. All right. Thank you. Well, the Downland Report starts at the top of the hour. Joe is standing by in our studio. What's the focus tonight, Joe? Hey, Nicole, tonight on the Downland Report, new air rescues in Afghanistan amid criticism on both sides of this exit plan and is the Taliban calling the shots? Plus, a COVID origin PR battle. China against the White House as Beijing blames America. And I'll speak with a doctor who's fed up with anti-vaxxers telling them to stay away if they get sick. That more at the top of the hour. Nicole, back to you. All right, thank you, Joe. We'll still ahead, more top stories making headlines around your nation, including the first document request from the new committee and investigating the January 6th Capitol attack. We continue tonight live from our news station headquarters here in Chicago. Here's a look at what's going on in your nation right now. Let's go back to that breaking news. Out of California tonight, evacuations in place as firefighters work to contain the South Fire. You can see that smoke and flames there. It's already grown to 100 acres, burned multiple structures. 100 homes are threatened. We're giving you a live look right now. This is the Fontana area. It's about 50 miles east of Los Angeles. And the House committee panel investigating the January 6th insurrection demanding a number of records from federal agencies looking for information about any events leading up to the deadly riot including communication within the White House under former President Trump, as well as planning and funding rallies held in Washington, D.C. So far, the committee has heard from police officers who were at the Capitol on the 6th. Adult film star Ron Jeremy has been indicted by a grand jury on more than 30 counts of sexual assault after allegations from more than 20 women, included in the counts forcible rape, battery, and preying on women while they slept. The case was first filed back last June. Jeremy has denied all wrongdoing. He's pleaded not guilty. R. Kelly's defense continued cross-examination today, calling into question claims by a woman who accused the singer of sexual abuse. They had the woman read letters where she said her parents suggested they benefit financially from Kelly and that she lie about her age. But the woman told prosecutors she was coerced by Kelly to write those letters in order to protect himself from legal trouble. Almost 90% of the federal rental assistance money meant to help tenants around the country avoid eviction has not been spent. That's according to a new report from the Treasury Department. The data shows states and cities have spent just $5 billion of the $46 billion approved by Congress last year. As always, we like to leave you with a smile. Tonight comes courtesy of an Arkansas ditch. It doesn't yet have an official name, but it does have its own Facebook page. A neighbor created a page for this ditch outside a fast food restaurant in the town of Benton. And this is why, because it ends up being the resting place of so many wayward vehicles that don't quite clear the corner. Definitely made us smile, although I'm sure the drivers feel a little differently. All right, that's it for Rush Hour tonight. A reminder, you can follow me on social media. Just search Nicole Burley on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next up, the Donlin Report. Later, on balance with Leland Vittert, News Nation Prime, and Banfield. 
And check headlines anytime at newsnationnow.com. Please have a great Wednesday night.